Hello there, this is Bren White. It's uh, time for episode four of uh, our new series uh, called Disciple. Uh, what it means to be a true follower of Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for joining in again. Uh, it's always a pleasure and a joy to be in the Word of God together, taking it in and uh, getting ready to put it into practice uh, each day, just as Jesus Christ told us to. Um, so today we are talking about um, pistis and prayer, that is to say the word for faith, uh, pisteo, uh, which we talked about a little bit last time. The word used by Jesus and the apostles uh, in the New Testament is the word uh, pistis or pisteo, and it means uh, I am totally loyal to him. That's what it means. I'm totally surrendered to Jesus. I am totally loyal to him. It's not some other meaning. Uh, these days, when people talk about faith or belief, um, it's a very academic uh, concept. Uh, that's not what was being talked about in this case. Uh, if somebody said pisteo, uh, it meant that they were giving their total allegiance to Jesus Christ and uh, their entire lives to Jesus Christ. It was a total surrender to him. Uh, based on who he is, and we talked about that last time, we'll talk more about it this time, but we'll also see the outcome of pistis and prayer, learning how to walk faithfully with the Father from Jesus himself, and it hinges on praying. A faithful life can only be lived by prayer. You cannot just know a bunch of stuff in your head, store it up, and uh, think that that's going to be enough to get you into heaven. That's not the way it works. Uh, you and I are called by Jesus Christ. We'll be reading about that. We're called by him personally. Uh, his words, uh, when he talks about choosing us, calling us, Coming to learn from him, he's talking to us, uh, each person. Uh, he did not save the masses. He came for you, for you. Uh, one sheep, the one sheep rule. Uh, Jesus Christ, the good shepherd, came looking for you. And uh, so he wants you to follow him, to pay attention to him, to listen to him, to learn from him. And what better person to learn from than the God of the universe, the maker and sustainer of all things, Jesus the Christ. Um, now, um, there are some other key words that we'll get to here in a second that are very important uh, in the New Testament uh, in terms of their meaning. A lot of times what's happened today is words lose their meaning. And uh, the power... Uh, of the Word of God is great. There is great power and clarity in the Word of God if it's properly handled, if it's properly presented. Uh, there is all kinds of power, um, and it's power for you and I to live by. Um, so um, let me just read a couple of things to you, and uh, we'll, get, we'll get rolling here. In Mark, uh, the book of Mark, uh, the Gospel of Mark, uh, chapter 1, verse 35, uh, after a very busy day before that, Jesus, uh, it says here, before daybreak the next morning, Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place to pray. This was the way Jesus Christ started his days, praying his way into the days. Um, and uh, there are all kinds of things that uh, are behind this. But we need to fully comprehend that even the one who was perfect, the perfect sacrificial lamb, uh, who obeyed and fulfilled the old law completely uh, in obedience to God, he shows us how to live a faithful life of obedience before the Father, in the Father's presence, in relationship with the Father, um, by praying his way into the day, praying his way through the day, sometimes getting off with his disciples uh, near a lake or somewhere else 
uh, in the afternoon and then getting off by himself at night uh, after everything was done and talking with the Father. Ta talking with the Father, walking with him, talking with him throughout the day and into the night. This is the way faithful living occurs. Um, so we give everything to Jesus because of who he is. He gave everything for us. And the first thing he teaches us is how to submit to God. We submit to God by praying, by talking with him, by conferring with him, by listening to him and to his word above all else, above all else. Um, this is a fundamental, this is a crucial. And uh, just a note about this passage in, in Mark 1, uh, it goes on uh, to say, uh, that uh, the disciples wanted him to uh, hurry off um, after his praying uh, to do uh, some preaching and teaching and to kind of be on the move. And uh, he actually goes and, and uh, talks with uh, a man who had leprosy. And uh, he, he finds this man. Uh, this is not the kind of person uh, most people are going to go looking for. This is not, uh, this man doesn't just have a virus. This man uh, actually uh, has a disease that if you get close enough to, to him, uh, if, if uh, you touch him, uh, you could also get the exact same disease which, which literally eats up your body, your entire body. Um, and uh, so he says, uh, uh, moved with compassion, seeing this man begging to be healed, Jesus reached out and touched him. Jesus saw this man with his disease, that if you touch him, you will die, or you will be in pain and agony the rest of your life. What does Jesus do? He reaches out to him. He finds him. He reaches out to him. He touches him. Physically touches him. Very important. I am willing, he said, be healed. So Jesus asked this man if he was willing to be healed. <laughs> the man says, I am willing. And Jesus says simply, be healed. That's simple. A disease that had no cure, no cure whatsoever, nothing really to help it in any way, or the pain and agony connected to it. Instantly, Instantly, the leprosy disappeared and the man was healed. Then Jesus went on his way with a stern warning. Don't tell anybody about this. Instead, go to the priest and let him, him examine you. Take along the offering required in the law of Moses for those who have been healed of leprosy. This will be a public testimony that you have been cleansed. But the, the man went and spread the word proclaiming to everyone what had happened. As a result, large crowds soon surrounded Jesus, and he couldn't publicly enter a town anywhere. He had to stay out in the secluded places, but people from everywhere kept coming to him. Now this tells you something about who Jesus is. He has the power to heal a disease that has no cure, on the spot, instantaneously. He has the love and compassion to reach out to and touch somebody who could actually kill him with his own disease. This is who Jesus Christ is, and he is the one leading us. He is the one who has chosen us to follow him. And uh, this is the same Christ who tells us in John chapter 16, Verse 33, take heart, take heart. I have overcome the world. Jesus Christ not only overcame all kinds of ailments and diseases and cured them completely. He not only forgave people's sins on the spot, he got in trouble for all of it. He got in trouble. Yeah. 
with government officials, with religious leaders, constantly was in trouble for doing the will of God. Very interesting. Very interesting. But he's saying to you, he's saying to you that the one who has power over life and death, who has all control, who is reigning right now on the right hand of God in heaven, has all control, all power, all authority. This Christ is saying to you, I have overcome the world. Now the question is, do you believe him? Are you listening to him? Jesus Christ has overcome the world, all right. And he did it in a very, very clear and momentous way. Jesus the Christ walked on this earth, interacting with human beings every single day. And he did the will of the Father. He is the one who has brought us the good news. Do you know what the good news is? Evangelion, the word in the New Testament for good news, also connected to the word evangelist, evangelion. It has to do with the fact that Jesus Christ brought victory to you. Victory over the world. Victory over lies and corruption and evil and destruction and death. Jesus Christ has brought victory to you. And he expects everybody who follows him to learn this way from him of living victoriously. He overcame the world for a reason. For his followers, he made a way. He made a way for us that is a way of freedom, he says in John. He says in Colossians through Paul, you've been set free in Christ. You are more than conquerors, victors in Christ. This is what Jesus and the apostles teach constantly throughout the New Testament text. But what happens when you look around today, even with some Christians today, there are some Christians who are not living as if Jesus Christ has totally overcome the world. They're not living as if they have been brought into this uh, victorious living. The word for it is, is Nike or Nikao. This victorious living that comes through Jesus Christ, living a perfect life, laying his life down deliberately for us as an atonement for our sinfulness. And he makes a way in dying, in dying in baptism, being, being crucified with him, the old self crucified, and being buried with him in baptism. This is Romans 6. And being raised into newness of life, a new life, an eternal life, a victorious life. So what we have today is we have a lot of uh, people, a lot of Christians living at, in a way that is like a victim. It's like somebody who's still in slavery. Uh, they're living as victims. Have you ever felt like a victim? Well, if you're a human being, probably so, because human beings hurt other human beings. Human beings bully and mistreat other human beings all the time. All the time. Um, this, is, this is a part of sin. Um, it's part of the outcome of sin. So anybody who's sinned or been around people who sin uh, can feel like a victim. But that's not what you are made for by the God of the universe. You are made for victorious living. And he has made a way for you and I to have that abundant life, that amazing life, that is in Christ Jesus only. Only Jesus Christ brings this good news of victorious living every single day all the way into eternity. With his help, with the help of the Spirit of God, God's Holy Spirit, 
which you receive when you're baptized into Christ, along with that forgiveness of sin that Peter talked about in Acts chapter 2, 38, this is what the good news is about. You have been released, released, aphesis, the word for forgiveness. You have been released from sin, from death, from the power of sin and death, the Apostle Paul teaches clearly. You've been set free. You are now uh, no longer a victim. Jesus Christ makes you a victor. He gives you the victory. And there are so many passages in the Bible about this, even in the Old Testament leading up to the teaching of Jesus and the apostles, which we'll get into in uh, just a minute. Um, I want you to, to note a couple of things um, in terms of some key words, as I mentioned a minute ago. In the New Testament, they make all the difference uh, when you are really serious about becoming a true disciple of Jesus the Christ. And uh, the first word I mentioned, pistis, uh, which has to do with that first step of faith, each step of faith, building your faithfulness, your confidence, your trust in the one who is leading you, the one who made you, and the one who saved you, Jesus, the Christ. And so this good news, Evangelion, is what brings people to follow Jesus. The good news, the Jesus priests in all these villages brought people out by the droves. And this is what the first disciples saw Jesus doing. And he prayed his way into every single day. And his followers saw that. And Jesus would remark periodically along the way, uh, Oh, you of little faith, uh, your faith, where is it? Um, when the Son of Man returns, will there be faith on the earth? Uh, this, this is most important to Jesus the Christ. His followers, everybody who becomes a learner, a follower of Jesus Christ, matetes, has to do with math, disciplined learning from the master, from the teacher, Jesus. This person, in order to follow Jesus, has to follow Jesus' example from Matthew 3 and his discussion in John 3 and what Peter says in Acts 2.38 uh, and all through the New Testament. The Apostle Paul talks about this, and the Apostle Peter talk about this uh, through all of their letters. Somebody is baptized into Christ. They have this new life in Christ. They have the Holy Spirit of God indwelling them. And the Holy Spirit is pouring out not only this faithfulness, but also... The, you know, the very character of, of Christ completely, including this agape love that brought him to us in the first place while we were still in sin. Agape, pistis, helps us to see and to begin to receive the agape love of God, this pure, holy, complete love from God. And every matetes has been baptized into Christ, so they have received the parakletos, the Holy Spirit of God, the Comforter, uh, the other Counselor. Um, this is the one who comes alongside, klesis, called alongside. The Holy Spirit is producing in the follower of Jesus Christ. He is the one doing it. And this is Galatians 5.22. The Holy Spirit produces in everybody who belongs to Jesus Christ, has his spirit in them. Uh, this is the teaching of the Apostle Paul. All of them have this pistis, this agape, the elpis, the hope. This is uh, Paul's teaching, 1 Corinthians 13. Agape, uh, elpis, 
And, um, and then he's talking about um, uh, the agape that brought him here in the first place, the agape that has this, this forgiveness in it, aphesis, releasing you from that sinful way, that captive way, where Satan was in charge. Now the Holy Spirit of God is in charge. Uh, this is what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And Jesus talks in John 14 about the, the peace that he is going to give his followers. Irene, the peace. And all of this, all of these things, plus more, make you and I victors. He gives us this victory in, in living on the earth and into eternity. It's the ultimate victory that a follower of Jesus Christ has if they are following the Good Shepherd, listening to his voice, obeying him, uh, letting him lead uh, each day and shepherd them. And um, so let me just read a few other passages related to this, that, uh, and, and maybe some that you can even look up uh, yourself. Um, in Deuteronomy 20, verse 4, it says, for the Lord your God is going with you. Huh. Even at, toward the beginning of the Bible, this, this idea of God going with us. We hear Jesus calling us to follow him, to learn from him, and we go with him. He goes with us. He says he, he chose us. Back in John 15, and he goes on, he says, He, God, the Lord, will fight for you against your enemies. And by the way, you all have enemies. Uh, anybody who is not with Christ is against him. This is the teaching of Jesus himself. So there, you will have enemies. There's no way to get around that. And they're enemies of God. They're anti-God. And he will give you victory. God himself will fight for you. He will go along with you, and he will give you victory. So even back in Deuteronomy, this was asserted by the living God, the Lord of all. In Psalm 20, in verse 5, it says, May we shout for joy when we hear of your victory and raise a victory banner in the name of our God. May the Lord... Uh, answer all your prayers. So here's a connection, even with the psalmist writing. Um, in the Old Testament, he, he is saying that there's joy that comes with this victory that comes from the Lord. And you and I should, should live as if we have a banner above us at all times uh, saying uh, it's, it's, the, it's God's victory. It's the Lord's victory. Our life is about the victory that comes from the Lord. I'm afraid sometimes we're timid. Sometimes we are afraid to say certain things because we know the world's reaction to it. Uh, the same reaction they had to Jesus Christ. And Jesus warns about this as well um, in John 15 and 16. But continue on a psalm. Psalm 44, verse 7 and 8. You are the one who gives us victory over our enemies. You disgrace those who hate us. Huh, interesting. Oh God, we give glory to you all day long and constantly praise your name. Now, do you see what, what God is doing here with his, his word, his word uh, cuts through things, right? That's that's what we're taught in the New Testament. And he, he's cutting through some things here. He's saying he, he is the, the one who brings victory. He is, he is the only one who brings victory. And, and consistently, constantly brings victory. He is the one. And he ends up disgracing those who show some kind of hatred toward us. So he's actually putting people in categories right here that in order to properly judge, he is judging that those people who hate his people 
deserve to be disgraced, number one, that's the truth of God, but also the people who are truly his people are going to do the next part. We give glory to you all day long and constantly praise your name. The people who actually belong to God are not quietly sitting somewhere on their hands. They're actually praising God all day long, giving glory to him by the way that they think, the way that they behave, the way they conduct themselves, the way that they speak, what they say. They don't say the same thing the world is saying. They don't speak the lies of the world. They speak the words of God, and they believe them completely, and they hold to them if they're truly his disciples. This is the teaching of Jesus the Christ. And it's, and it's clarifying, very important, very clarifying. And um, if you look at uh, Psalm 149, verse 4, For the Lord delights in his people. He crowns the humble with victory. Um, now, there are two things going on here. Um, those people who surrender completely every day to the Father, the way they have learned or are learning from Jesus in prayer, submitting to God every single day, they are the ones humbling themselves before God. They're putting themselves deliberately in the right, the right place. And the Lord delights in his people when they are doing this. Not when they're doing something else. Not when they're wasting time. Not when they're not living victoriously. But in fact, when they're humbling themselves, what does the New Testament say? The New Testament says what the Old Testament says. It says God lifts up, he exalts those who humble themselves before him, who submit themselves to his word in all things. He lifts them up. He lifts them up. He crowns the humble with victory. Those who submit to him and to his word at all times have total victory because of what Jesus Christ has done, the ultimate victory. Now, I want to encourage you to, to read um, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 58, which explains more, uh, some things about uh, death and about um, what happens. Uh, <laughs> When you're, when you're dying, especially if you're in Jesus Christ, you've been baptized into Jesus Christ, and you belong to him. Um, we have um, Luke 24, um, verse 1 through 53 is a long passage. I, I think you really should take time and, and read through that. It has a very clear uh, picture of victory, uh, of what Christ uh, is doing and has done. And uh, then there's a passage in Romans 6, uh, 5, and then 8 through 10 um, that explains some things about what I just talked about uh, to be in Christ. And then in Romans 8, verse 11, it says, The Spirit of God, who raised Jesus from the dead, lives in you. Now, that's what I was telling you earlier, right? You know you belong to God because you have died with Jesus Christ in baptism. And God has claimed you as his son, just as he did Jesus in Matthew chapter 3, when he came up out of the water. The Holy Spirit descends on him. And God proclaims him his beloved son. Continue on in Romans 8, 11. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same spirit living in you. Apostle Paul talks about the spirit of Christ, the spirit of grace, the Holy Spirit, the spirit. This is the spirit of God himself. It's God himself. And then, uh, if you would, um, turn with me to 1 John uh, chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5, 
verse 2 through 12. And this is meant to help cement what God has done for you in order to bring total victory to your life. Uh, Nike can't bring total victory to your life. Wearing some tennis shoes aren't going to do it. Only the God who made you can bring true and everlasting victory to you, to your living, and into eternal life. And it's only in Jesus Christ the Lord. Let's read this. This is how we know that we love the children of God by loving God and carrying out his commands. We do what God says. That's love. This love for God, uh, this is love for God to obey his commands. Twice, right in a row. And his commands are not burdensome. What, what God wants for you and I to do every day is not a burden. This is why Jesus came calling us to follow him and said, you know, uh, this is, is not, not heavy laden. Don't, don't, don't be thinking I'm putting more weight on you. Uh, he's lifting the weight off of you. And he's taking you from victim status to victor status. They're not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. Huh, there it is again. Interesting. Everyone born of God overcomes the world. Everybody who's a true follower of Jesus Christ following his, his example from the very beginning, overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world. Even our pistis. What has overcome the world? The faith of Jesus Christ brought into our living. Pistis. And so we say, pisteo. I give all of my loyalty to you because you are the Lord. Pistis. Everybody who has this kind of faith, trust, loyalty, conviction, overcomes the world. That's the way they live. They overcome the world by the power of God. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes, there's that word again, pistis, it's not a passing mental assent, believes, gives all their loyalty to, listens only to Jesus, that Jesus is the Son of God. These are the ones who overcome the world. All of us who are genuinely and wholeheartedly obeying what Jesus and the apostles taught every single day. We have this beautiful comfort and encouragement, this joy, this peace, this heart-shaping, heart-transforming agape love and this Elpis hope that has total certainty. It's a hope that is filled with certainty and expectation for the Lord's coming because the Lord has always fulfilled every promise he has ever made. He's the only trustworthy one. There is no one else. Stop listening to the world. You will be totally lost if you keep listening to the world. You must listen to the voice of the Good Shepherd every single day. Let him shepherd your heart, your soul, because he is the guardian of your soul. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.